Welcome to chapter four. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about immediate memory. And in immediate memory, we are going to cover how we control and manipulate information that is out in the environment and um, needs to be placed inside of our long-term memory or that is in our long-term memory and we need to think about it now. So immediate memory. All right. I hope you're really excited by that subtitle and really just champing at the bit, wanting to know what immediate memory really is. Well, it has different names. It's sometimes referred to as short-term memory. Sometimes it's referred to as working memory. It really depends on who the researcher is or which model of memory you're using, which of these two terms that you'll use. And I think you'll see by the end of this chapter that there is a distinction between short-term memory as defined by Atkinson and Schifrin's model versus working memory as defined by Badley's model. So let's jump in. And let's start with Atkinson and Schifrin. I've shown you their model before, but just to remind you, and I've kind of designed it a little bit differently this time. Um, so you've got the world out there that is producing stimuli for you to collect either through sight or hearing or taste or touch or smell. So you've got these five senses that are collecting information from the environment. And, you know, generally you've got to some degree information being collected by all five of those senses simultaneously. I mean, you know, you're eating dinner and talking or watching TV or listening to music or whatever it is all five of those senses are going to be activated during that period of time. So I think we can all agree you can't pay attention to all of it to the same degree. We had a very long discussion in the last chapter about your inability to pay attention to everything, right? Um, so all of this stuff lands in each of those individual senses, sensory memory, where it stays briefly. And then by paying attention or what Atkinson and Schifrin called encoding, you can move that information out of your sensory memory store into your short-term memory store. Now, we can keep it active in short-term memory through a process called rehearsal. And we'll talk about this more as this uh, chapter goes on, but the idea is if you keep thinking about the same material over and over again, it'll keep that material active in your short-term memory store. If you pay enough attention or um, you know, do a, a, a appropriate enough encoding strategy, you can move the information out of short-term memory into long-term memory, which is a whole other chapter. We'll talk about that later. But anything that's in your long-term memory, if you want to think about it again, you have to pull it into short-term memory in order to think about it again. And anything that requires a response output means that it ha the information has to have been moved into short-term memory to produce that output. So short-term memory is super important as a structure in the Atkinson and Schifrin model, because it's sort of the mediator between the outside world and your long-term memory store, um, and between your long-term memory store and the outside world, right? So it's really super important. A simple way to kind of think about your short-term memory is that it's whatever you're thinking about at the moment. Um, but that's an awfully close definition to working memory, so it's kind of tricky. Um, let's talk about what the function of our short-term memory stores are. Um, one is to give us a place to rehearse, right? So if you're trying to learn, um, you know, a new song or something like that, your short-term memory allows you to um, recursively, we call it, where it's like in that cycle where you over and over and over again, start at the beginning, work through the whole thing, start at the beginning, work through the whole thing like that. So it gives you a place for rehearsal. It gives you a place to hold information that you've retrieved from long-term memory. So you can now think about it. It gives you a place to hold information while you are attaching information that you already have in your short term in your long term memory onto that new piece of information, therefore making it more memorable in the long run. So we call that coding, where you're attaching things you already know to this new piece of information so that hopefully when you do store this new information, it will be stored next to or connected to the information that you already know, and that'll make it easier to store and it'll make it easier to find. And then also our short-term memory store is where we do all of our decision-making steps, right? Because if you're paying attention to something, it's happening in your short-term memory. So um, all of your 
weighing the pros and cons of something or um, deciding what the steps in the process are. All of that happens in your short-term memory. So what are the, some of the characteristics of short-term memory? Well, for one thing, um, the duration of information in short-term memory is about 30 seconds. Um, if you stop thinking about it, if something, um, you know, if you have changed your attention or um, whatever, it's gone out of short-term memory. And if, it, if you hadn't transferred it to long-term memory prior, it'll be like you never even saw that information or heard that information. It'll just be literally gone, completely wiped clean. Um, Atkinson and Schifrin proposed that information is lost out of short-term memory through decay, where it just sort of slowly, little bit by bit, sort of loses its activation in short-term memory and then disappears. They argued that it was not due to interference. It's not because you shifted attention or because you pulled something else out of long-term memory or something like that. They didn't think in interference was the big factor in clearing out your short-term memory. And I'm emphasizing that they didn't think so because that's not necessarily what how we, we tend to um, regard short-term memory anymore. We think it's probably um, just as likely to, you know, be the case that information is lost from short-term memory because something new has come into your thought pattern or into your visual field or into whatever you're paying attention to. Um, you can maintain information in short-term memory through um, rehearsal. There's the first type of rehearsal is what we call rote or maintenance rehearsal. Um, I can't remember. I think rote has kind of fallen out of style as a word in the cognitive literature, and they now call it maintenance rehearsal. The idea is that you're going over and over and over and over the same material just to make sure it doesn't fade out of your short term memory. Um, you're not doing anything else with the information, you're just keeping it there. It reminds me of when I was really little, and if I tell you how young I was, you might think my parents were neglectful, but I guess you know the world was different when I was younger. I was like three years old when I was allowed to walk probably four or five houses down to the corner where my friend lived. And I mean, I've got a three-year-old granddaughter, and I cannot re imagine um, letting her walk by herself along the street at all. Um, we had sidewalks and a parkway and stuff on the road. So it wasn't, it would take a lot for me to go off the sidewalk and into the street, but it just seems so dangerous now. But anyway, my mom's biggest complaint is that she would send me down there and I wouldn't ever come home. And I don't know why my friend's mom never said, Hey, shouldn't you be going home? But so my mom would be irritated. And so she told me you have to be home by two o'clock. And so I remember distinctly one of the times that she sent me down there walking along going two o'clock, two o'clock, to like with each of my feet stepping, I'd be like two o'clock, two o'clock, two. And then the second my friend's mom answered the door, I said, I got to go home at two o'clock. And then I immediately, you know, cleared my short term memory store. But I had maintained that information in my short term memory by just repeatedly, repeatedly saying it over and over again. Um, so that's that's a great example of a very, you know, um, low level, impl you know, implementation of maintenance rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal is when you are not just saying two o'clock, two o'clock, but you keep, you add new information onto it. You pull information that you know from your long-term memory, or you tie two things out in the environment together so that now the short-term memory has more bits to it. Um, you're elaborating on the information as you're rehearsing it. So you're putting more detail onto it. Now, if we don't um, rehearse, information rapidly decays out of our short-term memory store. So um, this is a nice curve that shows you, you know, three seconds after you stop thinking about the information, you see that little square, that first square on the left is at about 50%. Three seconds after you stop thinking about it, you, you're down to about 50% of what had been in your short-term memory being recallable. Um, as you go on out to 18 seconds, you're down to a, a, about two items off the list, right? Um, so your, your performance, not two items, 2% of the items off the list. So your performance rapidly declines once you stop doing any kind of rehearsal to keep stuff in your short-term memory store. So there's a lot of good information about, you know, the decay of information at a short-term memory store coming from, you know, the laboratory. Um, but what about another angle of examining short-term memory store and its capacity and duration? Um, anterior grade amnesia is sort of an, um, a natural experiment that happens sometimes where a person has, um, 
a, head, a, a brain injury. It's not a head injury. You don't usually get anterograde amnesia from like a blow to the head. You tend to get anterograde amnesia from something more like an infection. Um, common, um, you know, infectious agents that can cause anterograde amnesia would be um, encephalitis, meningitis, um, something like that. And these are um, pathogens that actually can cross the blood brain barrier, get up into the brain and can actually destroy brain structures. Um, so the, I, the definition of anterograde amnesia is the inability to encode new information into long-term memory. Now this chapter is on immediate memory, not long-term, but one of the ways that we can see how long information is stored in immediate memory is by having a person who can't transfer information into long-term memory, somebody with anterior grade amnesia, and see whether their, um, their memory store is longer or shorter than this estimated you know, 30 seconds that was produced in lab studies. Lab studies, you know, the one that I just showed you was like 18 seconds. You've lost almost everything. So what about a person who can't transfer to long-term memory? So therefore, they're only operating on short-term memory. How long will information stay in their memory um, without rehearsal? What they have found is about 30 seconds. About every 30 seconds, a person with anterior grade amnesia reports that they feel like they just regained consciousness, that they are finally awake for the first time, like every 30 seconds. And if you are conversing with a person with anterior grade amnesia and then leave the room and then come back in 30 seconds later, they think that you've just arrived for the day that they haven't seen you. Um, it's really clear that um, memories last only about 30 seconds in the short term memory store. Also, uh, anterior grade amnesia has revealed to us that the short term memory store is probably housed in the hippocampus. The hippocampus, there's um, our, our diagram on the right hand side here. Um, so it's kind of hard to see because this unfortunately isn't an intro to psych picture um, that has everything colorized, different colors. These are actually pretty good drawings of what the brain looks like. Um, so what you can see on the brain on the right, which is the normal brain, um, there's that area that is sort of curling under and, and it's kind of blurry, but you can see the label says hippocampus. It's pointing at that area. And there's, there's um, analogous areas on both sides of the brain. And so you see that part that's sort of curling under, that's the hippocampus. Um, you'll notice that in HM, who is the person on the left, um, there is nothing curling underneath. You can just see, you know, other structures behind. Um, what happened with HM is that he had a really bad seizure condition where he was having seizures um, several times a day. So the treatment that they tried was actually on purpose damaging his hippocampus. They thought maybe that was the center of his seizures. So on both sides of the brain, they, they obliterated his hippocampuses. Um, and one of the effects was that he no longer could transfer information to long-term memory. I'm not sure whether it cured his seizures. Actually, I'm not sure whether it worked, but it definitely had that impact on his hippocampus. I only know about HM because he became this classic case study for psychologists to, to really understand the impact of a, the loss of the hippocampus. What does it do for memory and awareness and other kinds of things? Um, so he was unable to transfer new information from, from the environment um, into long-term memory. And so whatever memory he had was completely dependent on short-term memory. And uh, he provided really good evidence that about 30 seconds, if he stops thinking about something, it's completely gone. He has absolutely no recollection of that information. Now, just to give you um, some perspective, he had his long-term memories that were had been encoded prior to this surgery. Those were still intact. Um, he had no other, pro he didn't have any problems with the with the uh, long-term memory, he had, he had the inability to transfer new information to long-term memory. Um, over the course of his life, he was able to learn a couple of new things, but it was with really, really, really a lot of um, repetition. And it was um, sort of lower level things. He had a lot of difficulty learning new facts, um, you know, who was the current president, things like that. He had a lot of difficulty with those kinds of things for his entire life. Now, the key thing with him is that they damaged both hippocampuses. Um, had one of them been left, he probably wouldn't have had this problem. Um, but because both were destroyed, you see the problem.
Now here's another guy, um, Clive Waring, and it says it can't be embedded, so, um, but don't worry, I've put it in the playlist. Clive Waring, he is an example of a person who developed anterior grade amnesia because he had um, encephalitis, or as the doctor on the video will call it, encephalitis, because apparently that's how you say that with an English accent. Um, and so he had an infection that affected not only his hippocampuses on both sides of his brain, but you'll, you'll also notice he has some emotionality that is a reflection of some damage to the frontal lobe also. So it's really important as you see his behavior and sort of his emotionality that you realize that, that part of that is coming from his frontal lobe damage that they mentioned in the video. And the memory parts, the, the inability to store new information is coming from his hippocampuses. So I thought you would find it interesting to see a, an actual case. So um, go ahead and watch that in the playlist and I will see you after the other side.